at QUT have been trying to do our little bit. Um, we've spent about $40 million um, of public money uh, trying, to, um, trying to refurbish and reconceptualise our various laboratory spaces, uh, supporting the engineering and science disciplines at Gardens Point. And we're now embarked in a very exciting project uh, to build a science and technology precinct, uh, which is worth about $230 million. We're actually We're actually not doing that with a view to standing still. Uh, but we're doing that because we want to ensure that we provide the best possible place for the best possible scientists and the best possible students, um, and hopefully in a, in, a, in a community environment that's nourishing. We've been holding our own, I guess, in the science and engineering disciplines, um, but we've decided to invest uh, nearly $300 million um, in science and engineering new buildings. Um, $270 million in new buildings and $230 million in a major new science and technology precinct and another $40 million to refurbish all the laboratories on the Gardens Point campus. So we have to think about our approaches, we have to build the facilities and we have to attract the staff, particularly new young staff. We've almost all been to the beach. We know what sand, seashells, corals, sponges and algae look like with the naked eye. But when we magnify these items, wonderful new images emerge. Dr Luke Nochtoft, a research fellow in biogeosciences at QUT, used a variety of microscopes to capture the following images. This is a skeleton of coralline red algae. You can see the spaces left behind by individual cells. This is a photo of sand from Heron Island. If you look closely, you can see various remains from green and red algae, mollusks and corals. How gorgeous is this image of a shell from a freshwater clam? It has been cut with a diamond saw, polished, then etched with dilute acid to reveal the microstructure of the crystals. Here we see the intricate surface detail on the spiral shell of a tiny marine snail collected from sand on the Great Barrier Reef. This shows an underwater photograph of a branching colony of stony coral from the Great Barrier Reef. This is a calcified germination spore of a coralline red algae on a grain of sand from Heron Reef. This is an image of a microorganism from a large group called Foraminifera. They are usually less than one millimetre in size and develop shell-like exteriors. This shows a section of green algae showing the arrangement of the mineral aragonite crystals inside the skeleton. Here we have elongate crystals of aragonite with six sides and a flat termination that have precipitated from seawater in fossil coral skeletons. This is a cross-section through a fossil coral where elongate crystals of aragonite cement have precipitated from seawater and filled a cavity in the coral skeleton. Here's a view of the external surface of a staghorn coral, showing cup-shaped coralites on the sides of each branch. And this is a view looking down the tip of a branch of a staghorn coral skeleton, showing the coralites. A coralite in the home of an individual coral polyp, whilst many polyps make up the colony. Here are some photographs of thin sections of staghorn coral skeletons. The Queensland Government has put in place a series of very long-term, very tough challenges around the Q2 Tomorrow's Queensland concept, where we're asked to make Queensland not just a smart state, but also a strong state economically, a green state environmentally, a healthy state, a fair state. And if you think about it, well, obviously those challenges aren't unique to Queensland, but they're, they're worldwide in their scope and they're extraordinarily tough and all of them are absolutely uh, built on the fundamentals of the science and the entrepreneurship and the innovation that's going to have to go into them. National Science Week's just great, I think. It's been, uh, there's, uh, I think this year there are about a thousand different events around the country, a million different people involved, so it's just phenomenal. Uh, improvements that we might need, I mean the, the real purpose of Science Week as far as I'm concerned is to inspire, I think your, your slogan, 
this time and last time, is ignite the imagination. Uh, ignite the imagination of the community, but most especially to ignite the imagination of kids. And I think to ignite the imagination of kids, the most important thing is to just demonstrate to them that they can change the world. And they can. You know, science across the board is going to be the way in which we can change all of the big issues of our time. Dana K. Bradford researches the birth of new neurons in adult brains at the Queensland Brain Institute and CSIRO. This is called adult neurogenesis. These amazing and beautiful images show neurons at various stages of development in mouse and human cultures. The cell nucleus is stained in blue while neurons are green. A typical neuron possesses three parts, a cell body containing the nucleus, an axon which sends signals to nearby neurons, and dendrites which receive information from other cells. So in the first image, an immature neuron has put out a single neurite which will most likely become the axon. In the next image, the neuron begins to extend other neurites in a search for neighbouring neurons to communicate with. And in the final image, the neuron is shown in all its glory. The longest, thickest section will become the axon and the remaining neurites will become dendrites. In the future, it may be possible to harness the capacity of our own neural stem cells to help the brain repair itself following injury or illness. Um, I'd like to challenge the audience here tonight, um, just as I, I sum up. Um, I know that we're all in some way related to science, but I also know that we're all people as well in the community. And um, whilst we've got our, our professional endeavours, there's also people around us. So my challenge for you tonight is to take one of those people, whether it be children, grandchildren, neighbours, anyone you come across, and spread one great, exciting message about National Science Week or about the science that you're involved with. Ryuta Nakajima currently works in the USA and is fascinated by the history and development of images and image making, particularly in contemporary life where we are saturated with images in every part of our lives. In order to expose more about the importance and function of visual stimuli in humans, she created a cuttlefish world. Using their ability to camouflage themselves into their backgrounds, she captured images as they changed in response to major 20th century paintings, photos and even videos instead of their natural backgrounds of sand, mud and seaweed. Cuttlefish process visual information gathered from the environment and convert that information into layers of different coloured pixels which allow them to create almost infinite varieties of colours and patterns to match their surroundings. This complex camouflage system does not stop at mimicking the natural world. Recently, a cuttlefish was documented camouflaging itself into artificial computer-generated patterns. Why do we make images? Where do they come from? And what is their primary function? For cuttlefish, the purpose is obviously survival and reproduction. For humanity, it's more complex. Maybe just appreciation of beauty or gaining some deeper understanding of a subject. But the overall process is similar. Inputting exterior information, interpreting that information and doing something in response. Well, that's it for this week. Make sure you find out about the events for this year's National Science Week in August, which you can find on the website. Join me next week where we look at a state-of-the-art surgical training facility in Brisbane. See you then. Good night.